morning, good afternoon, members of the FOMC. Today's staff presentation consists of an overview of current macroeconomic conditions, a discussion of forecasts and risks, and a dialogue on our policy recommendation. Data-dependent monetary policy involves taking stock of current developments in economic activity, inflation, the labor market, and financial conditions. Let's start with economic activity. The U.S. economy is growing at a moderate but slowing pace. Real GDP grew at an annual rate of 2.2% in Q1, followed by 2.1% in Q2. Growth was fueled by up upticks in consumer spending, state and local government expenditures, and business investment. However, net exports and residential fixed investment declined. Even as demand for goods is normalized, services spending remains strong, supported by strong household balance sheets, increases in real wages, and rising consumer sentiment. Excess savings still remain far above pre-pandemic levels, suggesting consumer spending growth could remain robust. Labor productivity growth came in at 3.5% annualized in Q2. Historic gaps between GDP and GDI suggest large mismeasurement, and productivity data is inherently noisy. But if growth remains positive, real wages could grow without commensurate increases in unit labor costs. Reflecting high uncertainty, future growth forecasts range significantly. The Atlanta Fed's GDP Now forecast puts Q3 real GDP growth at 5.1%, while the New York Fed staff's Q3 forecast is at 2.5%. Fed board SEP median forecasts put real GDP slowing in 2024 before returning to long-run potential in 2025. Turning to inflation, headline PCE was 3.5% year-over-year in August, well below last year's highs. The current state of underlying inflation, however, is likely lower. Six-month annualized core PCE is at 3% and is trended downward. Thursday's CPI report shows core CPI moderating as well, down to a 3.6% six-month rate. Despite progress on disinflation, sustained increases in the price level have had a disproportionate impact on low-income households who spend a large portion of their budgets on food, gas, and rent. New York Fed research shows Black and Hispanic households experienced higher inflation than white households during the pandemic due to greater spending on transportation and housing. Further, Richmond Fed research suggests that inflation has disproportionately eroded the purchasing power of rural areas, exacerbating geographic inequality. Decomposing core inflation reveals past and current inflation dynamics. Inflation in housing and non-housing services contributed to inflation over the past year. Sources of disinflation on the supply side include unwinding of supply chain disruptions and increases in labor supply and productivity. On the demand side, normalization of goods demand and anchored inflation expectations have been disinflationary. Over the past six months, annualized average wage growth has come down to 4%. The past two months show wage growth at sub-3% annualized, annualized levels, driven by declining wage growth in low-skill services. After declining throughout the pandemic, real wages grew at a moderate 2.2% in Q2. Based on wage and price inflation data, we believe the underlying rate of inflation is 3 to 3.5%. Three necessitating further disinflation. Declining but still robust wage growth reflects broader resilience in the labor market. Total non-farm payroll employment has rebounded back, rising by 336,000 in September. U3 and U6 unemployment are at 3.8 and 7% respectively. This return to pre-pandemic levels of unemployment has contributed to broad-based and inclusive gains across gender, racial, and educational groups. Indeed, Black and Hispanic unemployment sit near historic lows. Demand-side indicators show moderate labor market tightness. The jobs quit rate has fallen back to its pre-pandemic level, and job openings are down 20% from their peak. Furthermore, the ratio of vacancies to unemployment sits at 1.5, down from its high of 2.0. Bernanke and Blanchard in 2023 find V over U highly predictive of inflation and argue that the return to pre-pandemic V over U of 1.2 may be necessary for a full disinflation. Indeed, the beverage curve seems to be shifting back to its pre-pandemic position. Since the original outward shift was caused by COVID-related idiosyncrasies like increased labor reallocation and lower matching efficiency, a return to normal job switching levels could explain part of the inward shift. A fall in vacancies without a significant increase in layoffs suggests that excess labor demand has declined, leading to relatively painless loosening. On the labor supply side, aggregate LFPR has nearly fully recovered, 
driven by record highs in prime age female LFPR. Sustained adoption of work from home and a rise in immigration have further contributed to this recovery. However, factors lowering aggregate LFPR include population aging and early retirements. If these secular demographic factors dominate future LFPR behavior, it will make curbing imbalances of labor supply and demand more difficult. Finally, we turn to financial conditions, which indicate the transmission of monetary policy to real activity. Since the Fed began raising rates last March, broader conditions have tightened considerably. The Chicago Fed's NFCI shows conditions are more restrictive than pre-pandemic levels, though they have loosened since this spring. The Fed staff's new index shows financial conditions have contributed over half a percentage point headwind to GDP growth. In March of this year, mismatches in duration between short-term deposits and long-duration bonds on bank balance sheets led to regional bank failures. Even as the Fed's creation of the Bank Term Funding Program and strong capitalization of GSIBs stopped that contagion from spreading, the regional banking crisis contributed to further tightening. We will elaborate later on why we think future financial instability may be a serious risk. The July Senior Loan Officer Survey indicates tighter lending standards for commercial and household borrowers. Commercial bank credit fell in March and has not recovered. Reflecting greater stress, delinquency rates for credit card and auto loans have risen. However, mortgage delinquency rates have declined, reflecting households' desire to retain low fixed rate mortgages. Longer rates have risen as well, providing further tightening. The 10-year Treasury yield rose substantially in early October to 4.8%, and coupled with falling inflation expectations, has led to a rise in real interest rates. Even with the need to refinance debt at higher rates, though, corporate default risk seems low. Equity markets came down from summer highs due to higher for longer rate expectations, and the VIX index, which measures stock market volatility, saw a large uptick in September. To inform our recommendation, we weigh the upside risk of inflationary persistence against the downside risk of engineering an unforced recession. Inflation could prove persistent, plateauing at elevated levels due to labor market tightness, supply shocks in salient expenditures, and an anchoring of inflation expectations. First, real wage growth could exceed productivity growth, raising unit labor costs, which feed into price inflation. While the past two months of decelerating wages and unit labor cost growth, as well as a positive Q2 productivity growth, is consistent with 2% inflation, continued labor market tightness could re-accelerate wage growth among skilled workers, leading to stickier core services inflation. Furthermore, we've seen a tremendous rise in union activity and worker bargaining power as a consequence of labor market tightness and inflationary stress. New contacts may contain language over cost of living adjustments, and they might represent entrenched higher inflation expectations rather than catch up wage gains. Lastly, OPEC supply cuts and wars in Israel and Ukraine continue to add further uncertainty around commodity prices. Inflation in these salient goods risk unanchoring consumer inflation expectations. And if this is a long-term supply shock, it will likely necessitate further tightening. However, we see two factors that mitigate the risk of inflationary persistence. First, housing may contribute to disinflation. Zillow's Observed Rent Index, which only measures new market rents, shows we have already returned to pre-pandemic growth of 3.2%. We have yet to see this in CPI rents because it captures new and existing rents, making it lagged. Slower rent growth is reflected in a steady price-to-rent ratio this past year. This ratio usually declines in a rising interest rate environment as landowners demand higher yield. However, homeowners' refusal to give up their low fixed-rate mortgages has dried up market inventory. Thus, reduced home buying demand from higher mortgage rates have not manifested in lower home prices yet. Second, while inflationary persistence itself risks unanchoring long-run expectations and entrenching inflation in a self-fulfilling way, we view this risk as somewhat low. Long-run market expectations barely moved even when core PCE was over 5%, and given that the range of inflation outcomes is smaller now, it's unlikely long-run expectations will unanchor in the near term. Now, we move on to recessionary risks. Monetary policy acts with long and variable lags, and estimates of the length of these lags range from six months to two years or longer. We are in the latter camp. We believe that we have not seen the full effect of tight financial conditions on real economic activity as large amounts of corporate bonds have yet to be refinanced at higher rates. Goldman Sachs estimates that only 16% of corporate debt is set to mature over the next two years, 
and the coupon rate on a new investment grade bond is 1.5 percentage points higher than the average interest rate of outstanding debt. Borrowing costs haven't updated and thus current business investment and labor demand don't re fully reflect current tightening. Second, although the labor market remains strong, there's historical precedent for large and rapid softening in the near term. Theoretical nonlinearities in the Phillips curve imply that as inflation declines, the sacrifice ratio increases, suggesting that the final stretch of disinflation will be the most painful. When unemployment has risen by more than half a percentage point within a year, it ultimately rises by at least two percentage points, an observation that forms the basis for Somm's rule. Further, Cachetti et al. this year find that there has been no historical example of central bank-induced disinflation occurring without a recession. We aren't as pessimistic, though, as we believe anchor inflation expectations are in our favor this time. Additional risks to the downside involve financial stability and international spillover. The regional banking crisis appears to be over, but the underlying problem of balance sheet mismatches in duration remains. High cash yields in money market funds make deposits flightier than normal. Further, Morgan Stanley finds high office vacancy rates have lowered office prices by 30% as of June. Since commercial real estate lending is concentrated among regional banks, subdued office releasing activity may lead to more financial fragility. And finally, sluggish growth in China and recessions in Europe may reduce global demand. While global malaise could soften commodity prices, weakness abroad would likely damage U.S. growth prospects through lower net exports. Now we turn to our policy recommendation. Given promising data on disinflation and compelling risks with regard to monetary lags, labor market loosening, financial instability, and international spillovers, we believe that the risks associated with over-tightening outweigh those associated with under-tightening. Thus, our policy recommendation for the November FOMC meeting is as follows. We advise the Fed to pause and keep the target FFR in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent, while reducing its holdings of treasuries and MBS at the previously announced rate. On communication strategy, we suggest the Fed maintain its firm commitment to returning inflation back to 2%, while emphasizing data dependence and weighing the evolving balance of risks. Our recommendation is motivated by several factors. First, pausing gives the Fed more time to assess the path of productivity and unit labor costs and allows for the immaculate normalization of labor supply and demand imbalances to play out further. In addition, signaling strong inflation-fighting resolve can tighten financial conditions without further rate hikes. In fact, the recent rise in long-term Treasury yields not only reflected expectations for higher fiscal deficits, but also that rates will remain higher for longer due to robust economic data. Financial markets can internalize the Fed's priorities, which reduce the, reduces the amount that we need to hike. Plus, compared to the cost of under-tightening, engineering a recession through over-tightening is counterproductive and costlier. Disadvantaged workers, including Black, Hispanic, and less educated workers, have been the greatest beneficiaries of the current tight labor market, and Hoynes et al. in 2012 show that a period of rising unemployment disproportionately affects these same workers. We believe that potential hysteresis outweighs the distributional costs of slightly higher inflation. We should also acknowledge the impact of quantitative tightening on financial conditions, which pushes term premiums up by increasing market supply of treasuries and MBS. Atlanta Fed research shows the tightening impact of QT increases during crisis times, suggesting over-tightening can lead to even more over-tightening. Our assessment that the current FFR is sufficiently restrictive for now is based on data dependence rather than models of R star. The Fed should consider its policy restrictive if data suggests continued moderation of core inflation and the cooling of labor demand, as has been the case. However, a new uptrend in core inflation or rising inflation expectations might support further tightening. Data dependence is inherently backward-looking, but forecasts and model estimates alone may not be precise enough to determine policy. In conclusion, while the Fed is faced by risks on all sides, the current situation advises in favor of holding the policy rate steady for now, treating incoming data as our lodestar as we navigate under cloudy skies. Thank you, and we look forward to your questions.